Okay, welcome back, everybody. So uh, for those of you who've been following uh, the videos online, uh, we were not able to tape la uh, last, uh, the, the last lecture. So I'm just going to summarize what we did in the last lecture, um, since most of you are here. But um, for those who are watching online, uh, you might wonder what we did last time. So we, uh, what did we do? Um, Two lectures ago, we introduced this notion of continuity. What does it mean for a function to be continuous? And uh, we talked about various, uh, the metric definition of, of continuity. Uh, we also talked about the sequence definition of continuity. And last time, we spent a lot of time talking about a, a third definition of continuity uh, in terms of open sets. So just to remind everybody, the metric definition of continuity says, Basically, that close enough points get mapped to close points. That is, if I give you an epsilon, you can find me a delta such that any time two points start within delta of each other, they map to within epsilon of each other. Okay, For a particular, at each point P, you can find such a delta given any epsilon. Okay. And uh, the function, say the function is continuous everywhere, means at every p you can find such a delta. Okay, that's the metric definition. The uh, the second definition or the second equivalent uh, condition is that uh, the function preserves limits of sequences. So uh, if you have a continuous function, that means that the limit of the image of a convergent sequence is still convergent and it converges to the limit. Uh, the f of the limit of the sequence, okay? The third definition is completely a topological definition, and it just says that the inverse images of open sets are open. Uh, and, of course, it's very closely related to uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that inverse images of closed sets are closed. Okay, so this is what we discussed last time. We proved the third and fourth definition. Uh, some of the consequences we saw of the open set characterization, they're very easy to see uh, from that definition, is that the inverse image of, uh, sorry, is that the composition of continuous functions is continuous. Why? Well, if you have a map from space X to Y and Y to Z, and these are both continuous, then you know the inverse image of an open set going from here to here is open, and the inverse image of this set is also open because this one is open. And so this inverse image of the entire composition, uh, inverse image of an open set, is open. Very easy to see. Image of a compact set is compact. You've got a compact set here and another space here, and you're mapping it in. Well, let's cover, take an open cover of the image here. The pre-images form an open cover here. They're, they're, therefore, there's a finite subcover using only those sets. Therefore, their forward images also cover the set, and they're finite. Okay, so very, very nice. Uh, and one very, very quick uh, consequence of that is that a continuous real-valued function on a compact set must achieve its minimum and maximum. Why is that? Well, if it's real-valued, it's getting mapped into the real numbers. The image of a compact set is compact, and in the real numbers, that's the same as being Something and something. Closed and bounded. Very good. Uh, and if it's closed, then there is a point that's achieved by, uh, that achieves a maximum and minimum, and it, it has a preimage, and that's, those are the points that achieve the maximum and minimum. Okay? Okay. Very, very nice uh, facts about continuous functions and easy to see from that last definition. So what I want to talk about today is uniform continuity which we defined last time, but I will remind you what it is. It's actually related to the concept of continuity. So uh, the definition of uniform continuity is, well, uh, let's call a function from a metric space x to a metric space y uniformly continuous. if some condition holds. So we'll say it's uniformly continuous on x uh, if for all epsilon bigger than 0, there exists a delta bigger than 0 
such that for all x, and the important thing is that not only is this true for all x, but it's also true for all p, any point p you want in x, the, if the distance between x and p is less than delta, that implies the distance between what and what is less than epsilon. Yeah, f of x and f of p. So <clears throat> this looks a lot like the definition of continuity, except that we're saying that the same delta works for every p. You're given epsilon. The same delta works for all p uh, in x. OK? That's what it means to be uniformly continuous on x. Okay. Now, for the definition of continuity, remember p is specified before you start this definition because we were talking about having being continuous at a point. And then when you say it's continuous everywhere, you mean for each point, for every epsilon, there's a delta. Whereas now we're saying for every epsilon, there's a delta that works for each point. Okay. That's what it means to be uniform, right? It's like, you know, if, if we're all wearing the same uniform, we're wearing the same thing, right? So we have the same, I saw somebody roll their eyes, the same <laughs> delta that we're, we're all wearing the same delta, okay? That's what we're saying. Okay, great. So um, the picture I drew last time, uh, suggested uh, an example that was clearly not uniformly continuous. So for instance, you might have a function like so, and it might be, of course, this is a function that's only defined on this um, portion of the uh, real line. Okay? And uh, if I want to see if it's uniformly continuous. Well, it's clearly not. Why is it not uniformly continuous? You give me uh, a point, let's say here, P, and let's say take another point, Q. Well, here's F of Q. Here's F of P. Now, if I ask, if, if I specify an open interval around P, an epsilon ball, then clearly, well, the delta ball that will land in this region is actually quite large. Um, here's a delta ball that will land in this region. So if I pick anything in this region here around P, I will land in an epsilon ball around F of P. Yes? But notice, what does it take to land in an epsilon ball around F of Q? The same epsilon ball. Well, notice that it, it takes a much, much smaller delta ball to land in an epsilon ball around Q. OK? OK, now that by itself, by checking two points, seeing that this delta was different than that delta, doesn't make this necessarily not uniformly continuous. <coughs> right? Because you might say, oh, OK, well, look, this delta works for P as well. It's smaller, yeah? But what's the, what's, the, what's the difficulty? Will this delta work for all points? No, which ones are you going to worry about? To the right of Q, this, this delta actually will no longer work, OK? Because this function's doing something crazy, OK? <laughs> and why is it allowed to get away? and do something crazy? Well, it's because the domain of this function was not, in this case, it's not compact or closed, right? I mean, this endpoint, right? If, if it had, if I demanded that this function end here and be, be defined here, this thing couldn't have gone off to infinity and still be continuous, right? So we see in a very essential way um, the fact that, uh, um, uh, what uniform continuity